My name is Richard Shear, and this is the Montpelier Civic Forum, where we're going to be discussing town meeting issues. And today is a really important one because today we're going in for schools, and we're going in not only for the school budget, but we're also going for the school bond issue. Uh, this is not the Montpelier School District. This is the Montpelier Roxbury School District now, and I have the chair of the board of the school board of the Montpelier Roxbury School District. That's hard for me to say. Yes. How easy is it for you guys on the board? We're getting used to it. It's taking some, it's taking some time. We kind of have to remind ourselves. Right now, there's actually two boards operating, so we have to okay. switch Okay. How are there two boards? It's the same people, right? Uh, largely? It's largely the same people. There's the existing Montpelier School Board, which still exists and will exist for another year. It'll exist past the merger and then through the audit at the end of the year. Uh, and that has seven members, and it's the same seven members uh, it's had, although two positions are, are up. Um, that's a good that's question. Now, one of them is being contested, that, or one of them is not contested, but Tina Muncy is running. Tina the Muncy's other running. one, no one is running for. What happens if someone doesn't have 30 write-in votes and no one sits in that position? Will you appoint someone? or We can appoint someone. My understanding is that Steve Hinchin is going to wage a write-in campaign. Um, he didn't get his signatures in time because he was out of state. Uh, so he is planning to wage a write-in campaign. I'm, so hopefully that hopefully we won't have that problem. If we do have that problem, we will appoint someone. That's the person. Okay, now what is the other? The other board is the super board that has people from Roxbury on it. Yeah, so while the merger takes place, you've got, you know, the, the two districts don't actually technically merge until the 1st of July. So you have this one year where the merger has formed, uh, but the schools are still operating independently. You've got Roxbury operating as a district, and you've got Montpelier operating as a district. But next year, you'll have neither of those districts operating. You'll have the Montpelier-Roxbury school district. So while that is happening, you need school boards to run both the existing districts. So both the Montpelier District uh, School Board is operating and the Roxbury's existing school board is operating. Uh, but also you need a, a school board to put together the budget for the new so district. So this is a unified budget. This is, the yeah, two this is school a boards budget. will have no separate budget to work with. Uh, they're simply doing administrative Exactly. Cleaning. They're simply winding down their districts and you know, because you don't want to have to, you know, start up fresh on, on July 1st. You need to put a budget in place. You need to put policies in place. You need to do all those things before the district forms. You have the unified district actually has a board that was formed in October and has been uh, focused on those things, on putting a budget together, on, you know, putting policies in place, et cetera. Okay, let me ask just a few real simple merger questions. The teams will still be known as the Solons. Yes, I, I think everything will be will be the same in terms of names, et cetera. Dr. Rico will still be the superintendent. Um, we have not named a superintendent for the new district, but you know, Dr. Rico is currently the superintendent of Montpelier Schools, and we'll we'll name a superintendent when we get to that point. Okay, when do you think a superintendent will be named? Uh, hopefully soon. Is that process going on right now? Or? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, in terms of the Roxbury kids, some of them are not going to be at Montpelier High School. Could you explain the tuition buy-ins? Yes. What Roxbury currently right now has a K through six uh, school. Um, and then from seventh grade on, their students are tuitioned at other schools. Uh, in order to, because a lot of these kids have started at a place and are, are invested in that place, or you know, sophomores, juniors, et cetera, uh, it was decided and it made financial sense to not force anyone to disrupt their current education. So. Um, the students right now that are currently being tuitioned will continue to be tuitioned to the end of their... If they wish. If they wish. They can come to Montpelier or they continue to be tuitioned um, and the, the, you know, the district will cover that tuition uh, until they graduate. 
uh, but all students that um, are not being tuitioned, which would be the existing sixth graders on, um, cannot do, or have to come to Montpelier. Uh, or if, if they choose tuition, they have to pay. That's their tuition. And we anticipate that that will decline year by year by year. Yeah, year by year by year. I forget the exact numbers, but it will be a gradual decline. Um, and then in what five or six years, it'll it'll be zero in terms of tuition for for those students. In terms of transporting these kids in from Roxbury to Main Street Middle School, um, how long a drive is that? How how many buses are involved? Any idea? It's going to be, we're going to have one bus that will leave from, I believe, Roxbury Village School. We still have to work out the details, but a one bus that will leave from a common location, almost certainly Roxbury Village School, uh, that will come and drop off kids at the high school and the middle school. Uh, that bus route, the, the drive takes about half an hour, um, just assuming that buses are slower and it's got two stops, it'll probably be probably about 40 minutes. And to be honest, a lot of the kids in Montpelier who are bused right now, it's a 40, 45 minute ride to, to drive around. What's going to happen after school with after school activities? <coughs> um, we're planning to do, I believe the plan is to use our the existing Montpelier van um, and make sure that those students have a ride home after school. We thought it was very important that there be some sort of transportation option for extracurricular activities. Uh, because we want kids from Roxbury who are are coming to our school to have uh, to be fully integrated right. and to to be able to have uh, you know chances at extracurricular activities at sports at you know after school arts programs etc um, and you know just given the distance it's without transportation we felt there would be some kids that might find that hard to do. So we are going to provide an after after school bus. Now, for those of us, myself included, what was the deal, the tax deal that the that the state did as a sweetener to get us and to get Roxbury to come together and merge? So it was uh, an eight cent tax deal that declines two cents each year over four years. So it goes eight, six, four, two, and then zeros out. Uh, there's also uh, 150,000 or so uh, in kind of merger fees that the state gives. Um, so that's been, you know, that was actually helped us a lot in the current budget, given how difficult the state situation is and how unanticipated the state situation was. How difficult is the state situation? Do uh, you have the final number? Every year we come down to this when I do these shows with whoever is representing the school district. Usually, we still don't have the number, is, is what I hear. Do we have a, we a have, final number? We have most of the final numbers. We never get the final, final numbers until the end of the legislative session. So that can change. I mean, for instance, like you know, last year when we were talking uh, at town meeting day, we thought we'd have, I think, a slightly over one cent tax increase. The state numbers actually came in more favorable, and the budget, despite what was a a good budget. It was. It was. You know, it was, I think about 5.5 percent for student spending. We had a slight tax de decrease as a result of the state numbers. Uh, right now, the state numbers, as they stand, um, because of the merger incentives uh, and because of some other savings, uh, right now it's about a 2.6 percent increase uh, in Montpelier. Um, and a decrease in Roxbury. And a decrease in Roxbury. Why is that? Uh, because Roxbury ha gets a lot of savings from the merger. Um, you know, Montpelier's tax increase was, both are actually higher than projected by the merger because of the state situation. Uh, the, the biggest difference is that the, the dollar number that we get from the state um, was a lot smaller than anticipated uh, and went down, which usually it kind of goes up on kind of an inflationary uh, trajectory. But this year, because of the state budget crunch, it went down considerably, which means that the town and the city of Montpelier need to make up that gap. But even with making up the gap, Montpelier or Roxbury still went down. 
uh, Montpelier's went up, but uh, up pretty modestly compared to where some other towns are, are seen. What are the new additions in the budget? Not a, leaving the capital side alone, just the budget itself. Do we have new positions coming in? Um, are there new positions in the middle school to accommodate the Roxbury students? Or do we pick up teachers? Do, uh, we're adding, uh, actually there are, I don't believe, any real additions in Montpelier to accommodate the Roxbury students. As you know, last year we added uh, some teachers at the middle school uh, and you know, that gave us the capacity to, to cover this. Uh, we are adding some, some special educators. Uh, most of those are, are needs-based. Uh, what does that mean, needs-based? It means that um, oftentimes uh, students have needs that require one-on-one -on -one attention or special attention. Um, so you have to hire to, to fill those positions. And then some of that is written off against the state. The state uh, heavily subsidizes special education. The state heavily subsidizes special education. So a lot of those positions do get subsidized. Uh, we're adding a health uh, teacher. Uh, we're adding, adding a stu or a, uh, an increase to Where health. Where would the health teacher be? Which, in which the middle in, school. In the middle school? And that has been long long and needed that I've heard from the community and from middle school parents that... What would the health teacher... I know, I know yeah. the, the obvious <laughs> answer is the health teacher would teach health. Who is teaching health right now? I have to admit I'm not sure who the health teacher in okay. the middle school is. Um, but I know that, that there has been a long cry for uh, increased health education, uh, increased you know, sex education, and just making sure that our middle school students are, are, are getting you know, the the health education. What about our, our at-risk students in the high school? Are, are, is the programming for them staying the same? Is it slacking a bit or is it is it increasing? Uh, I believe we're adding, uh, um, I, I don't think, other than special education, I don't think we have any new positions that directly address at-risk kids. I mean, we've added some, some you know, last year. Uh, it's definitely a priority, um, but I think in terms of this budget, uh, we're staying static, we're stay, staying pretty much the same level. Uh, that brings us to our school resource office officer. Yes. Could you explain that program, given given what happened in Florida? Let Let's talk about safety in the schools, and let's start with the school resource officer. What is the role? My understanding is the school resource officer. Um, is a, a security presence at the school. Which school? At the high school, with a relationship with the Montpelier Police Department. Um, that is an officer, isn't it? Yes. Uh, so it gives us a, a security officer at the school who an is- An armed security officer or unarmed? I'm not sure if he's armed or not. I, I have to admit, I, I don't know. Okay. Um, I believe unarmed, but I'm not sure. And what does what does our resource officer do? I mean, he doesn't stand guard in the halls. What what does he do? What's his role? I think the role is largely to one kind of help be a liaison with the police department to foster that relationship, and then to be a security presence at the school if security is needed. And now, all three schools, you have to press the button to get to the office, yes. identify yourself before you come in. Yes, and. That is one security feature. Um, yeah, the school is doing, I think, a lot for security. We've, what are we doing for security? Let's start at Union. Uh, work our way up to the high school. Well, I think I think it's it makes sense to kind of talk about some some joint things that are sure, being done. Sure, absolutely. Uh, Take it the way that you want. Okay. All three schools have you know camera monitoring presence. They all have you know locked doors with monitored entry, uh, so no one can gain access without. Uh, ringing the bell, being seen, um, so no one is no one is able to enter the school during the school day, uh, you know, without without someone knowing who they are and and what they're entering for. Uh, there have been uh, trainings with the trainings and sessions with the the Montpelier Police Department and the Montpelier Fire Department. 
Who is trained in those uh, sessions? I believe the administrators. Um, teachers? I don't think teachers are. I think it's okay. I think it's coordination with the administrators about what to do and what plans are in place. Um, there are trainings within the schools with the teachers about what to do. Uh, the schools have gone through uh, through drills. Lockdown drills. Uh, I believe they have done lockdown drills. In fact, I think the middle school and elementary school uh, did one recently. Uh, you know, they have done things when they've had you know, for instance, when we had the incident. Uh, a very sad incident in January. Uh, the not the only the shooting at the shooting, high school. Yes, uh, you know, not only did we get to see how that security lockdown went into place, um, and it you know it went into place very well. The administrators knew what they were doing. They handled it very well. They got the students to secure locations. Uh, but after things like that, uh, the administration has been going going and you know, debriefing, looking at what went right, what went wrong. Uh, so there's been a lot of careful attention to detail about making sure that security measures are in place, that people know what to do, uh, that they're constantly reminded of what to do, and that the, the measures that are in place are, are continually refined. Was there counseling available for the students? There after was that counseling shooting? available to the students, and it was immediately offered to the students by the administration. Um, and I'm not sure how many people took advantage of it, but uh, yes, it was it was a high priority of the administration to make sure that uh, you know shortly following that event. Um, in fact, I believe it was that day that it was made known that there were services uh, for people who who wanted someone to talk to. Now you're only one of a number of board members, yes. so when I'm talking to you, I'm, I don't expect you to say, "Hey, I represent the board." Has there been any discussion that you've heard of arming teachers? in Montpelier, and has the board had taken any sort of preliminary thoughts or had any preliminary thoughts on arming 20% of our teachers? Uh, the board passed a strong resolution uh, at the last meeting uh, asking the legislature to act on strong gun control measures. We what would strong gun control measures be according to our school board? Uh, the language we used are gun control measures that are adequate to ensure the safety of our students. Uh, and we mentioned the bills before the legislature currently on background checks, uh, on making sure that known domestic abusers uh, don't uh, possess guns as a starting point, but certainly not an ending point. Um, I mean, I, I can't speak for all the board members. I have some some you know, pretty strong opinions on Army teachers. I think Could you give me a couple I of those? Can. One? Uh, I think it's, it's an absolutely horrible idea. Why? Uh, for several reasons. W one, just as a principle, I think in a civil society, we should be able to go to an open inviting school or an open inviting theater uh, without having to feel safe unless people are armed. And I think pretty much every other industrialized country in the world has that situation except for the United States. I think second, the job of the teacher should be to teach. They shouldn't have to, it's, it's asking a lot of a person to become an armed security guard and uh, you know, on a dime go from teaching math to uh, trying to pursue and, and harm or, or kill someone uh, with an armed fire weapon. Uh, also, if you look, I, I don't think it would be effective, even if you had good trained people. The, the hit rate for the New York, P, for the NYPD is about 18%. What does that mean? It means when they aim at a armed suspect or a suspect that they're trying to take down, it's about a one in five ch chance that they're gonna hit. So the idea that we're in video game land and suddenly a teacher is going to calmly come out into the hall and take down a shooter, uh, it just doesn't work that way. People get panicked. It's, it's, it's a very hard thing to do. It also gets confusing. You know, if you've got a SWAT team coming in, who do they know? Who the, you know, they see an armed person? Is, is that a teacher? Is that a perpetrator? You know, who is that? 
and then you just get more bullets flying. And then I think the biggest point, and this is true of, of honestly homes too, uh, you know, we tend to think about gun safety in terms, or we tend to get alarmed in gun situations when these huge mass shootings occur. But most gun deaths and most gun violence occurs in more singular shootings. And the more guns you put in a place, the more accidents you're gonna have, the more individual shootings you're gonna have, you're gonna get students who can, you know, one of those guns is not gonna be locked down properly, uh, et cetera. So I, I think it's just an absolutely horrible idea. Parents and concealed carry. Are our schools, are parents allowed to carry sidearms in a concealed manner if they're legally allowed to? Are our schools gun-free zones? My understanding is yes, that guns should not be in our schools. And guns are not allowed in our schools right now in a concealed manner. Now Montpelier students, all the way down to elementary school, have never been shy about expressing their opinions. Yes. Uh, we had it in Black Lives Matter. Uh, has the board met with students on guns? We haven't met with students on guns yet. Do you we, plan to? Uh, I would. I would very much welcome a meeting. Um, we have we have amazing students, for, you know, at all grade levels, um, but particularly our high school students who are really starting to, uh, you know, mature into adulthood and really grapple with some of these. I would. I would love to have a meeting with our students on on guns. You know, you know the. We've learned a lot from the Parkland students. What have we learned? Um, I, I, I mean, stepping back societally, I, I think they've really shown the adults how to act like adults, frankly, on some of these issues. Uh, you know, these are not, these should not be difficult solutions. I mean, we, every other country in the world has, you know, they've, they've got problems with, with mental illness, they've got problems with drugs, they've got problems with people feeling lonely, uh, they've got problems with broken families and alcoholism. None of them have mass shootings. The only difference is that we have an incredibly, uh, we have a gun culture and we have guns that are pervasive in numbers that are frankly insane. We have guns that do damage that in that can inflict an incredible amount of damage in an incredible short time. Uh, and we've, the last 20, 30 years, we've, we've gone backwards in terms of allowing access to these guns. Can we accommodate, how do we accommodate children and their parents who hold a different view on, on gun culture than many of their peers do in Montpelier? Is this a big mm -hmm. enough tent to allow those children to feel comfortable in our schools? I mean, I, th I think if you're talking about a hunting tradition, I think we can certainly honor a hunting tradition and have... But even a home, even a home safety tradition? I mean, I think we just have to have a frank conversation. If But if, there is room for those children and their views in our school. I think there's room for any views in our school. Uh, the question is in... The question is what, what are our policies and, and what actions do we take? If... If not offending those people or if not wanting to touch the gun debate means that we live with, with these mass shootings when no other advanced industrialized country on earth does because they're willing to take a different policy, is, is that the price we pay? Or do we try to turn our, our schools into kind of high security prison environments where everybody's armed and you've got security lockdowns? I mean, there's, you know, the price of the atmosphere of that, not to mention just the, the actual price of keeping that up, is, is that what we want to accommodate people who don't want gun regulations? Well, let's, take, let's take a less charged one. Yeah. A child who, does, who believes that Black Lives Matter is a political issue yes. and that the schools have taken a political stand, is there room for, for that child and their parents at, at Montpelier High School? Of course. I, what was that issue about? That issue is about recognizing... No, we're talking about the, the flag going yes, up. Yes, no, we're talking about the flag. Uh, that was another incident where I think we see really the, the maturity and the engagement of our current students. I mean, I've, again, this was a group of, of students who, who brought this to the attention of the board, who brought this to the attention well, of the board. What to, to the attention of the board? 
that despite the fact that Montpelier feels it's a very progressive forward-thinking community, uh, that for people in the high school and people in this community of color, uh, they have a different experience. They experience subtle racism. Sometimes they experience very overt racism. Is that the fault of the board partially? Uh, I think it's the fault of everyone. I, I think that that it's a it's a societal problem, um, and uh, it's a systematic problem. Uh, they also, and on top of that, they also feel that the curriculum and the uh, the instruction that they're getting that the people of color are not seen, or when they are seen, they're seen in kind of typical ways. How is the school board addressing that concern? Um, Yeah, certainly supporting, you know, the idea of, of flying the Black Lives Matter was, I think, really to continue a conversation that has been going on in the schools and the community for some time and to, to elevate it and give it some presence. Um, Let it be noted that the city council also passed yes. a resolution in support. Yes. Um, you know, we don't, the, the board does not have the level where we actually go in and, and dictate curriculum, but I think we can set values and expectations of the type of outcomes that we want and the type of community values that, that we wanna, wanna see. Um, and we wanna have every student feel that they're seen and that their, their heritage and their race and culture are seen and valued and elevated and, and, and talked about. Um, you know, in ways that they can feel proud of and feel that they are uh, truly included and embraced by the community. And I think for certain students, we're not having that experience at the high school. Uh, and I think that's something that was not necessarily being seen, even though uh, Montpelierites tend to think of themselves as progressive forward thinking people. And I'm not saying that we're not a progressive town, but I think we have, as I think, pretty much all places in the United States, um, we have a lot of work to do to really confront racism and systematic racism um, and the type of, the, the type of both subtle and, and frankly, you know, as we're seeing with, on the national level, overt racism, and the national level, and I think also in our own community, overt racism uh, that people of color have to confront every day. Our test scores. Are we seeing that in our test scores? Are, are we seeing a differentiation between um, uh, people of color and, and uh, majority white students in terms of test scores? Or? I have to admit, I'm not sure of the answer. I know, we, I know we have a problem with children <coughs> on food stamps. Yes, we def I, I know we definitely have a disparity uh, between our uh, high needs kids and um, you know, other students. I'm not sure how that breaks down based on, on, uh, on race. In terms of, of the Career Center, and we added a few, a few dollars more for the Career Center for kids going there. Yes. Are we trying in, in Montpelier to get rid of the middle track that in such a way that people will either be going off to, to two-year or four-year colleges mm -hmm. or they'll be going off to the Career Center to two-year tech centers? The person who terminates with a high school degree, are we trying to minimize though, the number that do that? Uh, I don't think we're necessarily trying to minimize the number. I think we're trying to make sure that, that all of our students are prepared and proficient to succeed after high school and to, to realize their full potential after high school. Is there a full potential if you only stop at high school these days? And think, don't go to either a tech school or community college or an apprenticeship or, or the military or, or something for further education after 12th grade. Uh, I think it depends on, on what you want to do. Um, what I can think you for, do with just a, a 12th grade, <coughs> with, with just 12 years of schooling these days? Um, I think there's a lot of people who, had, who have had success in various ways. But that was, in, you know, those are people our age. But for the young person nowadays who's confronting a job market that really takes a new set of skills, yes. is 12 years sufficient? Um, 
I think for certain people it can be. I, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's, it depends on what you want to do. I mean, clearly there are some things that, that require training beyond that. But for people who, who you know, want to do certain things, uh, for people who um, oftentimes are able to innovate outside of, of, you know, kind of more formalized situations, there, there are a lot of people out there who um, are very fulfilled with, with uh, you know, 12 years of schooling. One of the things we've done, which is a tradition in, in this district, uh, is Matt McLean's program of community-based learning. Mm -hmm. Is that still going on? Do most of the kids still participate in that? And what's the value of that? Uh, community certainly is actually one of the things that we are going to invest in more with the budget. Uh, it's a huge success. Uh, it's something we want to grow. The uh, the students that are doing it are having... Could you explain what it is? I, I kind of uh, did a shorthand on it. Yeah, it's basically an opportunity, and I think there are, are you know, someone like Mike McCraith would do a much better job. It's, it's an opportunity for students to really kind of go out and uh, get hands-on hands -on real-world experience uh, and have a good deal of say in designing designing that experience uh, and it's you know it's supervised to make sure that they're getting uh, you know the, the type of, of educational skills that they need but it's really an opportunity uh, to go out and to be innovative and to get real-world experience and to you know have that translate back into uh, you know, classroom credit. Drug and alcohol yes. and, and its relationship, its long-held relationship yes. in, with Montpelier High School. What's going on with that? Is there anything in this budget or anything that's been, that's come before the board in the last 12 months that we, discusses that? We haven't had anything that's formally come before the board. Um, it's, um, like honestly, it's not an issue I hear about a lot. It's something that I do. Do you think you will when July about. rolls around? In terms of how? In, in terms of you'll have more marijuana in Vermont, with closer the, to the surface. Um, yeah, I mean, if there's one thing that at least kind of the rumor mill is out there is that the high school has uh, a fair amount of marijuana use, and I hear most of that anecdotally. Um, I'm not sure what the what the effect of of the of the new marijuana law is. Uh, it's you know honestly, marijuana enforcement was pretty pretty lax prior to the law. Um, yeah, we'll 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 see. How are our numbers doing in in the elementary school? Let's look at the longer flow. We saw a flow from when I first came yes. here about 25 years ago. We saw the flow go down. Is it kind of Peaked out in the bottom and it starting its small. Projected to grow at least through 2022. So we've got healthy growth numbers um, for at least the next five years or so, four or five years. And that's enough to sustain our advanced placement. And I know it's it. Um, I know that it's scheduling hell in the high school to be able yes. to schedule enough, and we still have very small classes. What about the small class sizes? Is that is the board still puzzling over what to do with that? Uh, I actually th like you know if you look yeah you know, right now we've got about three hundred and fifty students in our high school and we have well over four hundred in the elementary school. And then there's a right. tiny middle school that hopefully will pick up some more from Roxbury. Yeah. Um, yeah, the the class numbers are going to grow for the high school. Uh, I think a lot of the quote unquote small class size problems will take care of themselves as those classes grow. Um, I am less concerned <laughs> with small classes than some others are. I I feel that the ability to offer uh, unique and interesting educational opportunities uh, to students is important and. You know, just some of the nature of some of those subjects, um, they're going to be small classes. And, you know, the numbers I've seen... What, I, how do you define a small class for the viewers? Um, I'm not sure there's a, a specific definition. Now this would be under 10 students, right? I, 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 well under 10. I 
Yeah, when you start getting six or seven, I think it's fair to call it a small class. Um, but you know, for certain subjects, that might, even if you had much larger classes to draw on, you still might only get a handful of students who are interested in that class. Um, and I think you know, preparing students for uh, the world, if, if they have the interest I mean, obviously, we can't offer everything, but um, I, I'm, I'm not as troubled. And, and the number of small classes, and I forget exactly what they were, but we did an analysis. It's, it's relatively small. I mean, it's, it's, we have a handful of what I think you would call truly small classes, under 10. Um, in, the, in the large scheme of things, is there ever any chance at picking up critical mass by um, merging with Union Theory? Union 32, Washington uh, Central. I think in the large scheme of things, yes. I, I think that's something, I mean, and that's a conversation that's been going on, I think, since Decades. about the mid-70s, yes. Uh, the, you know, when the Act 46 process began, we Act 46 had, being? Act 46 is the, the law that... Equalizes. Is, yeah, well... It's the law that the mergers took place under. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I yeah. had the wrong one. Um, so when the state created the, the incentives for the merger, and you know, we're now at the point where I think we're going to see some forced mergers uh, because the you know, pick your own partner. Will Washington chance. Central be a forced merger in terms of all their feeders and getting into a unified administrative structure? Uh, it would seem to be a candidate. I know that they have tried to figure things out and have run into various roadblocks. Um, and actually, what I was going to say is when the Act 46 process began, we, we reached out to U32 about having at least an exploratory discussion. Uh, and the answer we got back was we've got a lot of things to figure out amongst ourselves, uh, so we're going to pass. Um, do you see that in the future, just or the possibility of it? I, I think it's it's it, it makes sense on a lot of levels. Uh, what, what would it, be a few of the levels? Uh, you know, certainly from a, a resource and opportunity perspective. Uh, you know, these are two schools that are within a few miles of each other. Um, I think there, you know, there would be the ability to offer. You know, more extracurricular activities, more classes. Uh, can we get some of that without a formal merger? I think probably if we explore it, you know, yes. Uh, and especially as you know, technology evolves and there might be opportunities to, um, you know, maybe even like Skype in classes or Skype in a few students. Um, yeah, and we're already seeing that with you know, athletic and other opportunities where. Uh, for certain sports, you know, Montpelier students can play on the U32 team. Or Northfield. Yeah, or Nor exactly. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think those those opportunities are there. I I think we have to be careful about how we do it. And right now, it's very hypothetical. I, I one of one of the you know, and this is kind of from a broader community's perspective. You know, Montpelier is one of the few places in Vermont, and frankly, in in the country right now where a good number of the students can go from K through 12 and be able to walk to their schools. And we have schools that are really still physically. Well, it's a good walk from Town Hill Road over <laughs> to the high school. Well, not all places, but I mean, for a, you know, a good ch core chunk of our students, um, that's a realistic possibility. And in other places, it's, it's maybe, you know, you might get one school or, or two schools, but having all three schools where I, I, I'm, yeah, certainly the core downtown can do it. If that were the case, we wouldn't have large parking lots at the high school, <laughs> would we? Yes, well, we might want to at some point wonder whether we should have such a large parking lot at the high school. But, um, you know, having, when you look at some of the, some towns that have hollowed out, uh, what's happened is they've done things like they've taken their schools and other things and put them out in the back 40. Um, and it, 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 has, it has impacts on the town. And I think that you know, if, we do, if we do see something like merge with U32, I, I think a, a community discussion about 
those type of effects. Is, Which is leads us happening. to our bond issue. Yes. And how we're fortifying our current set of schools. Yes. Walk me through the bond issue. Let's start at the middle school and then go to the high school and then the elementary. Okay. So the middle school has had a fair amount of improvements. We've upgraded the heat. We've done some roof work. We've renovated some bathrooms uh, as a part of the regular budget and actually, uh, I believe, from the reserve. We did a bond a few years and ago. Yeah, there was a bond a few years ago. So middle school actually is not going to be part of this bond. And the middle school is going to be get some attention also with, I think, one of the great features of the current budget is for the first time ever we're implementing a capital plan. Uh, now, what does that mean this year and what does that mean in future years? It basically means that we're going to put aside a certain amount of money each year, which we've never done before, which is surprising, uh, for scheduled maintenance on our three buildings. And it's, it's some of the stuff is not particularly sexy. It's it's roof work. It's it's renovating bathrooms. So what you're saying, in other words, is making our existing plant last longer simply because we're not in crisis mode. Yes, and and making sure that they're just always functioning at a, at a high level, or and and yeah, you know, which middle school has you know until we did some heat work. You know, I was hearing tales about. You know, some days a, a wing of the middle school, people had to wear coats. So just you know, the heat was uneven, et cetera. And that's you know, that's not acceptable. So we need we need to make sure we're on top of, of maintenance like that and, and on top of it consistently. Uh, I think the bond is, is actually a very exciting and and um, very needed investment in in union and in the high school. Okay, in union. <coughs> okay, so we have an elevator. <coughs> Well, right now, there's, there's kind of three projects at Union. Uh, one is a safety project, which is rewiring the school. A lot of the, the actual wiring was is... from the 30s, wasn't it? It's from the 30s. Uh, you know, knob and tube wiring. We need to get safe modern wiring in there. Um, Even the PA system, I think, is, yeah. is due for renovation in this. Yes. Is that not true? Yes. It's so... It's... it's it's way overdue. I think that's a no-brainer, uh, and it's something we, we have to do. Um, the other is an elevator and a remodeled entryway on the side of the school. Uh, the current elevator is also, uh, I don't know if it's quite 1930s, but it's... Is it ADA compliant at, at all? It is. My understanding is not ADA compliant. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's about, That's the Americans for Disabilities Act. Yeah, Americans Act. for Disabilities Act. I mean, so the whole purpose of having an elevator like that is to make sure that a student with, you know, who, who's not able to get up and down stairs themselves uh, can get up and down stairs. And my understanding is right now for certain students who might be in a wheelchair, they, they might just not be able to get into that elevator. Um, so making sure that that elevator serves the purpose of allowing people who need who have needs where they need to take an elevator up, actually have an elevator they can use, uh, is important. And you know that's that's a needed expense. Also, as part of that, um, I believe there's restrooms attached to this as well. Uh, I don't believe we're doing. Well, we I, I I have to look. I'm not. I know we're doing restrooms at the the, the high, high school, school, and we've done restrooms at, at Union. Um, whether there's some restroom work associated with the entryway, I, I'd have to go back and look. Um, but we are doing a new entryway, which especially with preschoolers at the at which direction will that be? Uh, facing Park Avenue. Okay. I believe up towards the. So it's the east. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it'll be uh, a much uh, safer uh, entryway. It'll it'll be. An so area that would be the gateway to the. <coughs> To the playground. Yes, it'll exactly. Okay, let's walk through the playground. That's been a project that's been going on for years, or at least in concept. Yes, has been going. Can you explain how we got to the the point? How much has been spent on a playground, and how we got to the point of, of how much we've spent on a playground, uh, or we're going to spend yeah. on the playground? Well, the playground is. The playground is actually, I, I find it very exciting. The playground has been part of a, an iterative community process. Uh, we've had some wonderful 
uh, community leaders, some, some parents who spent a lot of volunteer time coming up with the concept, um, working really hard to, to get momentum for this. Uh, we have, we have, an, we have an, an outdated playground and we have an urban school setting, even though... Urban school setting? Well, we, ha we have... For, for this is a small town. <laughs> for Vermont, okay. we have you know compared to you know like Faced East Montpelier or, or Faiston, okay. we have a pretty urban school setting. We've got a, a small lot, uh, very little of its grass. Okay, uh, I a see. A lot what of it's occupied okay. by the hill. Uh, we don't have you know field after field after field like you do when you go to East Montpelier. So, to make the most of that space. Uh, you know, some parents came together with the administration uh, and did an iterative process, came up with a, a fantastic concept for a playground. Uh, when we started getting into actually putting it together, also because we have, frankly, uh, I know Montpelier is a small town, we've got a relatively urban setting school, uh, we ran into some, some serious environmental problems that need to be addressed, uh, that this bond will address. Um, primarily, the, the site where the playground currently exists used to be the site of an old beautiful high school building that at the beginning of last century burned essentially to the ground, uh, leaving a whole bunch of nasty stuff in the soil. Uh, and while right now it's, it's relatively capped, the contamination is a few feet down, once you start digging in it, you're bringing that contamination up. So uh, basically the, the soil from that site needs to be removed, brought to a remediation site or brought somewhere it can be stored um, and resoiled. And then also there's some serious stormwater compliance and stormwater redesign issues because that site is actually a large source of stormwater pollution. So a project that initially started at a couple of hundred thousand dollars is up to what now? Uh, the total cost of the project is 1.5 million with a, about half of that being needed environmental remediation that's pretty much both beyond the control of the project in terms of the design, et cetera, um, and also stuff that, that we have to do. So for 1.5 million, will this be the end in the budget for the play? This, this is will, this phase this will one? Will it. there be a phase two or phase three? This, this will make this will make the project happen. Um, happen means what? Happens means we'll get the soil out of there. We'll get stormwater compliance. We'll get new soil in, and we'll get a we'll get a, a playground built that uses the. Uh, entirety of that lot space for uh, a really wonderful educational and interactive playground setting that I think benefits not just the Will school, the district the come in for another capital request for that playground to expand on that playground to make it even better? Uh, do you anticipate? I do not anticipate. I, I think that the idea behind this, especially given that I think we tried to do it in small chunks and keep hitting hitting problems in terms of expenses. The idea behind this bond is to get it done, to get it done soup to nuts, uh, to deal with all the environmental problems, uh, to build the, the playground design that fully incorporates that space, uh, and to have a playground in place that should last us uh, you know, 20, 30 years and be not just a, a great educational space for our students and a very you know safe and interactive play space, uh, but also something that really benefits the surrounding community. I think it's going to be uh, a magnet for people to come to. Whereas right now we have, you know, frankly, a playground and school. Will space. the um, will the snow hill disappear that the kids sled down? Uh, I think it will certainly be altered. I think there will be sledding opportunities there, but it, there's I think that part of that's going to be kind of an amphitheater. Um, it's going to be much more, much more interactive on that hill, but there will be opportunities for kids to sled. Let's go to the high school. Yes. What are we doing? We're doing roof work. Yes. We're doing a lot of roof work, and I don't know if you've seen the pictures, but uh, several classrooms recently have had uh, to sit there with 
plastic bags and buckets collecting water, especially when you had uh, some of the real steep warming days uh, where all that snow and melted and uh, you know, was capped with rain, et cetera. Uh, so we're doing some roof work. Uh, we're also doing, and, and I think this is both you know, very exciting and similar to the playground, a, a, an area where uh, not just is there going to be a huge investment in the school, but also I think an investment in, in public space and public engagement, uh, renovating the wing that where the gymnasium and the auditorium are. Uh, and and uh, there's going to be kind of a wholesale renovation of the gym where we're going to uh, create uh, classrooms uh, and interactive learning spaces for uh, both the arts, but also... So they won't be as big a gym? The gym will be the same size. It's the area around the gym. There's, there's storage space. There's a lot of dead space in there. Uh, there's locker rooms that were built for locker room needs that have that don't exist anymore. Um, there are huge locker rooms and now most that's of is that being created into turned into a wellness center? Well there's what is the wellness the center well, that's in the budget? Uh, the wellness center is basically uh, a health and workout center. Uh, right now it's structured in a way where it's also not ADA compliant. Um, and it's, it's kind of on a second floor, and then there's a first floor uh, that, um, it, because of the way it's designed, is, is hard to use. Uh, there's a lot of supervisory problems. It's hard to supervise the students with the way it's currently structured. Uh, so there will be a, uh, a renovation of, of basically the fitness and, and So work. we're not talking about bringing in Planet Fitness style equipment. <coughs> No, we're, plan we're talking about using space so we can have uh, a place where people can go and, uh, and, and work out and exercise and access you know, physical health equipment. Uh, what is physical health equipment? <laughs> uh, I think a lot of it's going to be the similar equipment that we have now, um, hmm. you know, weights, et cetera. Um, but it'll place where... All students can access it right now. Again, um, you know, students with disabilities will have, have difficulty accessing it the way it's currently designed. Uh, it's also going to be designed in a way that's going to be uh, much easier to supervise and to make sure that the, you know, the students are being appropriately. Now, there's work scheduled for Smiley Auditorium. Yes. What is the work in Smiley? Uh, we're going to redesign it again that it was designed that where there's dead and unusable space, particularly on the side. Um, we're going to improve the acoustics. We're going to improve the stage design. Uh, right now it has, has really horrible acoustics. Uh, there's just some, some renovations that are needed because things are getting old. Uh, also, as part of this, there's going to be space where performers can actually kind of have a, a green room and a stage and a setting room. Um, so we're going to turn it into a, a place that's, that's going to be much more amenable uh, to arts performance, uh, to music performance, uh, and also much more amenable to having community events there where... What kind of community events? Uh, that space is actually the second largest public forum outside of Barry Opera House in central Vermont. So we could have, we could have speakers there, uh, we could have live music there. Uh, these are a lot of things that, that I don't think are happening because the acoustics are terrible, uh, the setup is terrible, uh, there's nowhere for a performer to have a staging room, these type of, of things that uh, you would expect from an auditorium of that size don't exist. How many? What's the size of that auditorium? Huh? What is the rough seating? Uh, don't quote me. I think it's about six or seven hundred, but I could be wrong. Uh, it's it's decent sized. I was I was given the number once. I don't have it offhand. Six or seven. You mean it's, it's for the old Montpelier High School before we started the the decline? Yeah. Uh, in terms of of the uh, bond issue, I believe that there's a bond that finally paying itself there off. There is a bond. That, so this will replace a bond that was several years ago. 
Uh, so we are replacing one bond with another. And how much on the average house, how much will this be? Uh, if we were to vote it in, what, what would the average household pay for this? It will be a one, one cent this year, which is included in the overall budget. So it's included in the 2.6% increase. Uh, next year, it will go up to 2.5 cents, and then it will decline afterwards. But the, the, the bond has been calculated in long-term financial planning, uh, and a lot of that will be offset with there are in the current budget there's uh, some one-time expenses that are there uh, and um, also some other you know, with increasing student enrollment etc that uh, that that increase is accounted for how does we've got a few more minutes left yes. how does the school board view the um, school budget uh, materials that are going through the legislature, the proposal, the master proposal on the school property tax. How does our school district look at that? Uh, I'm not sure our school district has uh, a formal position. I mean, I mean we weighed in on X61. We w yes. Uh, have we weighed in? Have we considered weighing in on the change in property tax, income tax, and that balance? Um, it hasn't been discussed yet. I mean, I have I have some views. I think some other members have some views. Um, I think right now we're trying to figure out kind of what what these proposals mean and well, it's been pushed off go. for a year, so yeah. we've got time to do it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, if the amount of money comes to this comes from the state similarly. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's just tough to know what the what the effect will be. I, I certainly think that I mean my personal view is that to the extent that we can take pressure off the property tax and put it onto income tax, I, I think that's fair. I, I think that there is a legitimate issue, um, and I know that that there's you know there's property tax sensitivity. Etc. Um, yeah, but but there are people who are property rich and income constrained. A lot of that has to do with you know property they bought Age. 20, <laughs> yeah 20, 30 years ago, um, and yeah. So I, I think that's I think that's a healthy discussion to have statewide, uh, but it's not one that the board has weighed in on, and and it may be one as as, as the debate matures. Boy, we've gone a long distance yes. tonight in terms of, of discussing the schools. And I want to thank you for appearing, uh, taking oh, the thank time you for off. Having me. Um, but I want to talk to you. And I, wanted, I want you to know that what's going to happen on town meeting is important. And it's not only because your taxes are involved, but we've got a city council races contested in all three districts. We talked to Ann Watson about her mayoral run. We talked to John Odom about his city clerkdom. And what's important is that you learn about this. Take, take the opportunity to watch all of these shows. Orca is also showing some candidate forums. Uh, the Bridge had an entire issue devoted to the election. Uh, Times Argus has covered it. Get educated and then make sure that your friends get out and that your family gets out to vote. Because that's the vitality of this town. And Jim would tell you how many parents volunteer, how many hours in our schools, how many people are on planning boards, committees for both cities and schools. And that's the power and vitality for Montpelier, not only today, but for our future. So please, get out and vote on town meeting day. Thank you very much.